I will read some housekeeping information and then we can start. Um, these are for today and also for the next day. So um, fire escapes are clearly marked and in case of fire, any staff and volunteer will guide you outside. Um, regarding accessible toilets, there is one on the ground floor and two outside. Uh, there is one changing place his toilet with a changing table and a hoist. Um, there are also non accessible toilet on the lower floor. Um, if anyone needs any kind of support, including going to the toilet, eating, drinking, or whatever kind of support, we have three volunteers in flourish and jackets, and they are able to do this. Uh, if you cannot find them, you can ask in your team at the registration desk. Um, if the room is very crowded, this is not the case, so it's fine. Skip. Um, the quiet room is upstairs. Um, one of the Enil uh, team can take people if the directions are not clear. Um, a reminder for the speakers and for everyone to speak slowly um, and also to respect the pronouns. Uh, workshops are being uh, streamed and recorded. For those watching remotely, if they have questions, they should email them to Enil after the Freedom Drive and we will aim to get back to everyone. Um, re uh, a reminder also for people uh, for tomorrow to enter to the European Parliament, uh, you need to bring the ID or pa passport. After the Freedom Drive, we would like to everyone to complete the feedback form, which can be found on the Freedom Drive website. Thanks. Um, okay, I think we can start. Um, our, able, our workshop is called Ableism, what it is and how to fight it. Uh, my name is Antonella, my pronouns are she, her. I'm uh, originally from Italy, but living in Brussels and working for INI as policy officer. And my background is in gender and disability rights. Um, I will now introduce the speakers um, on my... Right, <laughs> Josephine Cornet, pronounce uh, she they. Uh, Josephine is a Belgian artist writer and has a multidisciplinary practice with a background in art history, feminism, queer studies, and disability studies. Um, Josephine was an editor at Recto Verso, where they helped coordinate the issue of grip. Josephine works with engagement arts and today is helping to build a grassroots movement of grip artists in Belgium. In 2021, Josephine won the Driver Gant Thesis Prize with A House Called Pain, a poetic autobiography about death, grief, and disability. Uh, on my left, Ingrid Thunem, pronouns they, them. Ingrid is a member of the Enid Board as well as the president of the Norwegian Association of Youth with Disabilities, an umbrella organization working toward a universally designed society with full participation of disabled and chronic ill young adults. Beyond being a passionate advocate for the human rights of disabled people, Ingrid has dedicated substantial efforts to building an inclusive queer community, being also the chairperson of Queer Disabled Norway. Currently, Ingrid is immersed in academia, pursuing a PhD in the intricate intersection of sexuality and disability. Um, in Josephine, we will find a dynamic combination between creativity and activism. This unique energy will challenge conventional boundaries and drive the creep arts movement forward. Someone called them the Belgian Frida Kahlo. <laughs> Um, in Ingrid, we will witness how the simplicity and the quiet strength of Arctic living translate into a powerful study dedication to building inclusive communities. Their passion for ensuring that every voice is heard and valued is as profound as the vast as the landscape they call home. Okay, uh, very briefly, the program. Um, um, there will be a short introduction. We want to know about uh, you, who you are. Um, we encourage to your participation. This workshop will be very interactive. Um, and we will also have a very short introduction um, on what Able is. Um, we have then the presentation from the two speakers. 
followed by the interactive part and uh, final feedback with the questions and answers. Um, okay, we can yeah present the Mentimeter. Okay, um, you should be able next. Oh. <laughs> Where is the mouse? <laughs> ah, here it is. Okay. Um. Yes, you, uh, I don't know if you're already connected to Wi-Fi, otherwise you can find the instructions. Um, and if everyone is okay, we can go to the next slide with the QR code. Is it fine for you? Yes. Next one. Okay, you should be able to scan. Um, we will ask this uh, short question through Mentimeter, but you can also reply from the audience directly, just raise your hand or move your head or whatever you want. Is it fine? We can move to the question. Next slide, yeah. Um, can you all see the question? No? At the previous slide. But the previous slide, it's yeah. I never went to the as well. You, you click present, right? You click on present. Um, uh -huh, here. Yes, thanks. Yeah. yeah. So we go to the next slide? I think we can go. No? Yes? If it doesn't work, I can just ask and you can reply. Okay. Mm -hmm. Getting so many likes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can we give it another go? Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's try. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So we would like to get an idea of who the audience is. Uh, I can't read on the mirror, so maybe you can uh, read the possible answers. Uh, the possible answers, wait, we also people are ready to find, maybe it's fine. The <laughs> possible answers are disabled person, ally, friend, or partner, a family member, disabled people's organization or service provider, more of them, and none of them. Okay. Um, so, so far we have 19 people who identify as a disabled person. We here with three allies. Um, three people um, are service providers, and four of them are like tick more of the boxes. Okay. The you can log in on your phone, or you can just uh, reply in person. Yeah, it's fine. Yes. So, did say anything? Just put something up. We don't have to communicate with you. Use your phone. I'm not going to use your phone, so I'm just going to hang. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. 
So then we'll make that 22, all right? Yes. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Inclusion yes. yes. It's also, it's just to get like a general image. So it's also yeah. nothing that is like too much of an importance. It's it's more. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I want to be part of that. I totally agree. Yes, yes absolutely. Um, next slide. Okay, we would like to know what uh, ableism is for you. Maybe just the first word that comes to your mind when you think about this. And still, you can use this tool or reply in person. So again, to repeat, you can put it in your phones, but if you don't want to use a phone, you can also just shout some words. Yes, even better. Yes. Um, it's also about ableism, it's about conforming mm -hmm. to norms set by non-disabled people, standards set by non-disabled people, culture. It's all okay. about okay. people. Okay, okay. About discriminates, yeah. Mm -hmm. Someone else? Oh. <laughs> I can also go around. Yeah, yeah, I'm using the mic because I'm sitting here. Um, but I can also go downstairs. If there is there somebody who maybe also wants to answer um through the microphone, maybe share what they put into the into their mobile phone. Or you can just also shout it through the room. That's also can I give you the mic? Yeah. My name is uh, Lukas. I come from Poland. Uh, 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 what what comes to my mind is distribution uh, distribution of goods because after all the disabled uh, ableist uh, attitudes is also connected with it and uh, public discourse as well. Because public discourse, unfortunately, I don't know in in your countries, but in Poland, unfortunately, it is still full of ableist attitudes, even unconsciousness. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Is there maybe somebody else who wants to reply, or who wants to add? Yeah, sure. Yes, my name is Martina. I wrote down discrimination and uh, exclusion and uh, negative attitudes. Thank you. Shall we go to the next one? Uh, no, it's okay. We can go back later. Um, okay. So um, someone usually thinks about uh, physical or structural barriers someone think about uh, behaviors. So I would like to ask to the speakers if they could define um, what ableism is for both of you. Um, or yeah, if you want to do that by example. So I, I, I was looking at you because that is a hell of a question. <laughs> I, <know>. um, <laughs> I think Maybe I'm going to give an answer that is a bit of a non-answer, but I give. I think ableism. Let me come from it from a different angle. I'm I'm trying to find my words. Ableism and uh, what is in contrast to ableism, accessibility is about access. It is about do I can I get into a certain space? Do I feel welcome? Do I, for example, in my field, I work in the arts. Do I see myself represented on the stage? Um, the absence of those things is something that I would define as ableism, but I think that we have to also like broaden up the term and also consider the intersectionality of it. When we talk about access, we're also talking about access for queer people, people of color, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so it is a term that I think, in a certain way, needs to be very defined for disabled people because we really need to have that conversation. But as much as we need to define it, I think we also need to like broaden it up a lot more. Um, 
And I think that's something you can also connect to, right? Absolutely. For me, it has to be, as it, it's not only accessible if it's accessible for you as a disabled person, it has to be accessible of all of your identities, no matter what they are. And I think for me, uh, ableism is the structural, but also the attitudinal barriers that you meet that can be from your neighbor, it can be from the state, uh, it can be small and it can be big, but it's hindering you from living the life that you're supposed to be. And uh, if it's hard to understand, you can also uh, compare it to racism or sexism because it's the same. It's just different reasons why they are discriminating us, but it's the same discrimination and the same barriers and, and the problems. And that's why we have to face it together and think intersectional. So we have to think of all of those at the same time, not only work with ableism, but also with sexism, homophobia, transphobia, uh, and racism as well. And also, um, something that comes to mind for me is also fat bodies. Um, a lot of accessibility rights are also accessibility rights for people uh, in fat bodies. Um, and then I was also thinking there's a proverb, um, and you can like switch it around, which is like, um, same money, different wallet. Um, and that's also something that comes to mind. And I wanted to ask to the audience if you're all familiar with the um, concept of intersectionality, so, or maybe you want to explain briefly, clearly. So in the word intersectionality, you can hear that it's like an intersection. Do, if an intersection is where many roads meet. And the same way intersectionality is how you have many identities in you that all meet at the same time. And they can be, sometimes they can help each other and give you more privileges. And in other situations, they can work together and make it less privileged. For example, for me as a wheelchair user that is often run as a woman, I will meet uh, discrimination because I'm in a wheelchair and that will also be multifaceted uh, with me being read as a female person. And then if I have, were a person of color, that would interact as well, as well as you can see that, for example, if I was a man, the discrimination I would have met because of my wheelchair might would have been dif different. So it's how all the identities you have uh, works together like an intersection. Yeah. Um, do you have any questions about this for the speakers? Yes. Um, in all honesty, it is a term that I have barely never heard before, disabilism. So it is something very new to me. So thank you for introducing that to me. Um, and, and I apparently have some research to do. <laughs> yes, we have another question.
Yeah, and I very much agree that um, language and creating language around this and using also the right language, I think is very important. Um, to, for example, to make the comparison in Flanders, um, if you would translate ableism in Dutch, it would be validisme, which is very much based on the word valid. Um, and you could have an entire discussion on whether that is actually an accurate translation. Um, and I think the Flemish or the Dutch vocabulary in generally still has a very big problem with a lot of terms that we, as we're now speaking English, can use and, and can kind of like play with um, that these don't translate. They don't have a translation yet in Flemish or in Dutch. Um, there is no translation for the word able-bodiedness. We have no idea how to talk about it. And then it really becomes very difficult to point out the problem, right? Um, so yeah, the, the, that's maybe also like me saying that we need to think on language <laughs> in Flanders. Yeah, but but also I did like I accident I didn't accidentally not include disabledism. That was absolutely on purpose because this workshop is focusing ma mainly on ableism, and that I made the cooperation to sexism and racism because most people that are here might not know ableism and disabledism that well. So the the point of this workshop is to be like a ground, uh, one step at a time so then maybe next year or another time we could do a workshop where we're starting to distinct uh, ableism from disabledism but right now a lot of people don't even know that they are experiencing ableism so that's why i use the comparison to racism because we are most of us uh are used to talking about racism and sexism and then to start the conversation about ableism, it's to understand that it's the same discrimination. So it was on purpose, uh, but I am very aware of the work that is happening in, the, in London and UK, and it's very important. Uh, and we have to talk more about this ableism as well, but I think today we should so start with ableism and then we can do the next step the next time. Okay, maybe now we can proceed uh, with the presentations. Um, first with your Josephine. Um, we will hear about disabled voices and experiences ableism in art education, but maybe you can uh, explain more what's about. All right. I have to do some multitasking as well because I uh, brought a presentation and we're also going to listen to audio files in a couple of minutes. Um, but uh, th this is my part of the workshop. Um, let's see if this works. Nope, this doesn't work. This also doesn't work. But this does work. Um, my name is uh, uh, Josephine in Flemish, or Josephine um, in, in English. Um, I am an artist, um, as in I studied fine arts. Um, I, I had the privilege to be capable of... Uh, maintaining studies like this. And then I also have a background, um, so like a master degree in art history, as well as in gender and diversity studies. And through that very long career of studying, I also started focusing a lot on um, specifically critical disability studies, script theory. And then with being an artist and still working stuff, one of my main questions in my work is always like, how can I, um, how can I do my activism through the art that I'm making? So what I brought for you today is basically a part there's a very difficult text written there. You don't have to read it. I'll explain it. Um, but I basically brought my work today because um, a couple of years ago, I got a little bit of money from some organizations, um, which is in Flanders called SOTA, Engagement Arts, uh, which are two grassroots movements of artists trying to change um, in either against sexism and or for a fair practice or a better practice in the arts. Um, and then I worked together with two other artists because I very much believe in, in collaborative artistic practice. I think that's very good that we do this. And I worked together with Mira Bresink, which is another disabled uh, artist that I know very well. We're really good friends. Um, she's an actress and theater maker. And then we also worked together with Simon Alemers. Um, what we basically did, Mira and I, is that we interviewed people. We interviewed people who identify as disabled. So they either have a physical disability or they identify as neurodiverse or they identify in, in different aspects or whatever, but we basically collected voices. 
And because this was an experience of like one on one from one disabled person to another, people opened up about us because we were very specifically interested in how they experienced their art education. Um, so in a minute, we're going to listen to some voices who either had an art education or were still doing their art education at the time. And what we basically did, Mira and I, is that we asked them questions. We asked them a lot of questions as in what happened to you? What did you do? Uh, what were the things that were good about the school? What were the things that were not good about the school? And throughout doing, we have about like seven or eight of these testimonies. We started to see similar lines certain aspects, certain themes, certain things kept on returning time and time and time again. And that's why we know, like when we knew we were onto something big. So then what we did, and it's the photos that you can see here, is that we basically made an audio installation. And if you put it on the headphone, you could listen to their testimonies. So we basically cut out our voices. So you could only hear the person talking. They were anonymous. So they couldn't have any repercussions from school or from people that didn't, that would have been not so super kind to them. Um, but you basically listen for about half an hour to somebody talking to you about what it is to be disabled and study arts. Um, after this, audio installation that we did, Mira and I started touring because um, then we made uh, some kind of, with a fancy word, we call this in performance art, a performance lecture, where basically we go to institution to institution and we basically also show them all the material. And this is exactly some of the material that I can show you now. Um, we're gonna listen to some of these voices. I cut out some uh, specific aspects of them, some specific things, and then I thematically put them together. That's what we're going to listen to. Um, I hope this will work. I just checked the audio with the tech, the tech guy. Um, the audio is not super loud, but um, so there might be some accessibility and like hearing problems there because some of the audio is also not the best quality. Um, but what I did do is that I transcribed everything. So you will also be capable of following everything on the screen, either in Dutch or in Flemish. So let's do this. Yes. Um, before I start, also, I will give you a trigger warning because, of course, I will, of course, um, considering um, ableism, we're going to hear a lot of people talking about ableist experiences that they have. But also, in generally, I also want to um, warn you that some of this audio can get very personal or can get very heavy. If that is the case, know that I will make myself available after the workshop where you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me. And I'm very happy to also listen to your story or to like take you through the experience that you have. We'll also take maybe, I think, some minutes after listening to the audio to like give this, this room some space to breathe. Um, but it's something I would like to tell you in advance. So I will try to put my tech head on and um, to see if I can start the audio. Ik kan het niet meer dat ik langer ook met jullie moet doen. 
Beispiel, um eine Lösung zu leisten, die nicht zu hoffentlich ist für jemanden. Zu hoffentlich, der nicht mehr so hoffentlich ist, wenn man über die Rede bringt, das ist auch sehr gut. something about the time for the think that uh make uh, and come all the to it so from all of my own head and and then that's a good response it's it's not here of my kids and about comes to that that we want to do things and that's what I'm going to say that's it um yeah and um who thinks you that I can do in the first day that she got saved through that you know the fact that from um ja, en um, zo van hoe ga je dat dan nu doen? Denk je dat je dat aan kan? Um, en heel erg, ja, ik denk dat ik het moet niet worden, maar heel erg nadruk leggen op het feit dat ik daar met een, dat ik dus met een rugzak daar rondloop en dat zij het jammer vinden dat ik niet meer heb kunnen doen. Ik 
That was the last. Um, that's the one we heard. This is for in a couple of minutes. Um, first of all, I want to check the temperature of this room because we listened to some really nasty stuff. Um, and I also got a remark from Antonella that apparently there's some accessibility problems also for uh, that I can help with, right? Maybe you can just uh, read some of them. Uh, yes. You said so. um, Um, thank you for taking the vulnerability, the vulnerability. Yes, thank you so much. And I am very sorry that you, you're having this experience. Um, yes, yes. And I get the irony also of the situation and I am very sorry. Um, what can we specifically do now for you? Yes. Um, shall I do a couple of them or do you want me to do all of them? Just a couple? Yes, and again, thank you. And I'm very sorry. Let me go through the PowerPoint. Thank you. Here's one. There was an elevator, but we weren't allowed to use it. Now, I did use it sometimes, but then I always heard whenever I saw someone from security or a teacher, that we actually weren't allowed to use it. You're constantly labeled as unprofessional if you cry or get angry or get frust frustrated by the things other people don't experience as intense. As if um, there are too many stimuli and uh, and sounds, uh, smells, or visuals. I know I love doing this, but how the world of dance and performance works and the limited space there is for emotions and being different makes that I can't do this. My teacher said, this is just acting. Acting is top sport, and if you can't handle it, then you shouldn't be here. I also remember how they, at the time, um, at the start, sorry, forced me to do something like this, naming a performance about disability. And I thought that was really weird. And also like very personally, and I don't think that was okay. Like, And I'm looking for a last one. You always had to stand up where you were painting. And when I took a chair to sit, he saw, uh, he saw that and I told him that I needed that. He wouldn't like hit me, but his posture showed me that he thought that that was not okay. That that was a very, uh, that was a very personal battle with that person because I always attended class, but when I got sick and I had proof from the doctor and I went back, he said, oh, you're back. 
and he had put my easel and my painting supplies in the corridor. And then they tell you stuff like, yeah, that's normal to only sleep for three hours a night. And that's just the life of a graphic designer, which makes that you can just don't have the space as a student to tell them something about this. These are a couple of them. Is there something else that I can do for you? Yeah, thank you. Yes. I see somebody who wants to react all in the back. I want to go with the microphone, maybe. Is it okay if I also just give it to you? Yeah, of course. Oh, so fine. Hello. Hello. Um, so in terms of reacting to what we've just heard, I think it's quite interesting because as a disabled majority in the room, these are, we're very used to hearing or having these experiences ourselves. So I wonder if there's a possibility that we sort of, we intrinsically know even if we don't have the language for it we know intrinsically what ableism and disabledism is we know what that feeling of rejection and discrimination feels like because we are constantly up against it now we've just listened to 15 20 minutes of other people sharing their experiences and these of course resonate very very deeply with us but I wonder if there's space now within this conversation to move it forward in terms of how can we process this? How can we work through some of this stuff? How can we start fighting and amplifying our voices against the ableism that we're all experiencing within this room? Because otherwise it feels almost the opposite of self-congratulatory of us saying, oh, well done us, we're all experiencing discrimination. Does, does this, sorry, yeah, does that make, I hope I make sense. Thank you. So uh, it's a great reacting. Uh, I think you make a very well point that a lot of us are experiencing ableism, but uh, a little bit of the goal with this workshop is to be even aware that it is actually ableism. I hear that you're very reflected and very know that when you uh, disc are experience discrimination, you know that it's ableism. But I think a lot of us doesn't necessarily do. Uh, that's uh, going to be some of what I'm going to talk about in my, in my conversation. But when I grew up, I just learned that I had to adapt to the world. And I I learned that, okay, this is your fault. It's you that are the problem. Oh, you can't get in somewhere. Okay, you're just unlucky. Or someone say something nasty to you at the train. You're just unlucky. And then it took me some years to understand that, no, you're actually experienced saying ableism and how can we do something about it so the the goal is now that uh josephine is going to talk a little bit more and then me and antonella is going to have a, a little bit of a conversation about this journey to starting to realize that what we are experiencing is, is in fact ableism and it's not okay uh, and then we will have a little bit of a group discussion in the room uh, of how we can handle this in our everyday life. Like, how do we fight the ableism that we all all face? So I hope, hope that was a little bit of an answer to your question. Is there somebody else who wants to react? Yes. Hi, um, I'm Irish. My name is Shane, but I live here in Belgium and I'm doing my master's currently in disability studies at the University of Leeds online. I can't be in two places at once, obviously. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to add to that um, about kind of with ableism, how kind of deeply embedded ableism is within our societies. Um, I resonated a lot with this because I was diagnosed with uh, dyspraxia like at 14. So a lot of 
I got a lot of ableist comments before I got a diagnosis. People told me, like teachers were pretty happy to tell my parents that I had no potential and I was just focused in class. And it was actually only one out of the 12 teachers I had might have said, maybe there's something here that we should get tested for. And fortunately I got a diagnosis that way. But something I want to add is that we need like solidarity with non-disabled people. Like if you look at the queer movement or the Black Lives Matter movement, like if some of these comments said it to, you know, a, per a queer person or a person of color, there will be uproar. But the fact that ableism is so deeply embedded that it's just so okay for teachers and just even just members of the public to pass off on these comments. And like, look at us all here today. We either have a disability or we're an assistant or we're, but I, or we're an ally. You don't, there's not that general interest. It's not like... Maybe that's not the correct way to word it, but disability isn't sexy enough. That's the issue. Like when you look at our generation, and I'm talking about people mainly in their 20s, and I get so frustrated with friends of mine because when they think of human rights, they think of they think of gay rights, they think of people of color, people of color, they think of refugees, which is great, and that intersectionality, like you said, is extremely important. But what drives me crazy is that people don't even know the CRPD exists. That disability rights are human rights, actually. And it's not, it's not, people can't engage with it. People can't engage with the sexy inc infographic they see on Instagram. And we need that solidarity from non-disabled people if we're going to make these structural changes that you're, that we're talking about right in this room today. Like, that's how I would argue that we're, how we're going to process. And that's how we're going to move. Like, I think often, like you said, under the medical model, the disability, like the disability lies within the individual but if you're looking at the social model of disability which Ingrid mentioned and I've alluded to earlier it's, it's socio-environmental barriers that's what makes you disabled essentially um, and you know non-disabled people also need to step up and actually educate themselves and we've seen them do this with other movements why not this movement as well mm -hmm. okay sorry I'm going to start ranting now um, no 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 don't worry about it I love rants um you, I think both of the, the feedback that we got is really, I think, very much on the spot. Um, something that I maybe haven't pointed out enough is that this is a work that I made or this is research that I did of what I was aware very, very clearly that this would be shown to people who do not have disabilities. For so many people of, um, like I, I tour with these, like they're, they're on my USB stick in my wallet and I have it everywhere and then I pop it and I let people listen to it. And for so many people, this is the first time that they hear this. Like this is, an, this is a work for non-disabled uh, people in arts because the art world very much has a problem with able-bodiedness and ableism. Um, this is their first time they get in contact with stuff like this. And this is, this is my personal attempt to make it sexy. <laughs> I know. Yeah, 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 I know. I know. But I very much agree on you with this. It is. And it is also something to me that is baffling how this, how this is not a, a mainstream con conversation we have. And it's still also something that I haven't figured out myself why that is the case. Um, to then shift into also the previous uh, comment that we got on like what can we do um something that i that is accompanied with this research and with all these voices that i did is um i made a checklist and again you have to understand this checklist we'll go through it together but you have to understand this checklist as something again that i give to people without disabilities um, it's based on previous work considering white privilege, but where I basically rewrote the whole flyer um, and it's a quite big flyer. So like if you unfold it, you get a page that is about this, that I basically gave to people who work in art, to art institutions, um, to cultural houses, theater places, whatever. And I'm very happy to say that like I'm out of flyers now. So about 300 people <laughs> in Flanders somewhere working in arts and culture have some of these flyers have it at home it's printed everywhere and it's something that I constantly spread um, so this is the thing that turns around like the shock that we we now we don't get it because we know indeed what it is and how it sounds like but when you get the starting point of hearing all these voices and actually understanding that there's a line through everything that we call ableism this is something that I can like counteract with and say like okay but this is what you can take home and what you can do um and that's called the non-ableist uh like non-ableism flyer 
Um, this is the introduction. Um, shall I read it out loud? Yes, I will. Then I am very happy to, le to read it out loud for you. Yes, absolutely. I'm very happy to do that for you. This tools was, paid, uh, was based on unpacking the invisible knapsack by Peggy McIntosh and We Will Not Cancel Us by Adrian Mary Brown. Are we as institutions doing enough to make space for people with disabilities? This checklist is an unfinished and is nearly a beginning to unpack the invisible barriers of how deeply rooted enablist bias can be. Yet, the change towards a non non-ableist discourse is yours to provide. This is a reflective tool to start a conversation or when hung up in a space as an act of activism. And these are the statements. I should be able to enter and participate within the institutions with only limited help of others. I can enter, eat, buy, watch, attend, everything that is provided by the institution. There are financial resources available if I'm in need of accessibility. I can take day as, uh, days off, not answering emails, skip meetings, cancel appointments due to my disability without consequences. I'm not just tolerated if I fit the, requirement, uh, the required norms of the institution and I am not considered in quotes, difficult or in quotes, counterproductive for my accessibility needs. There is a guarantee that if I approach a quote unquote person in charge, I will face a listening, compassionate answer and proactive change. I do not jeopardize my career or chances when I point out a flaw or a situation. I am not at random made aware of my body shape, abilities, and physical appearance when participating within the institution, nor do people stare at me. The institution is taking accountability and responsibility of their inaccessibility and or ableist bias by them and their public towards me without feeling performative. I am provided adequate support and resources in case of physical, verbal, psychological, and emotional ableist violence. I can answer the institution and see myself widely represented throughout the whole structure. I can see myself in the program and the content of the institution and see my narrative represented with a physical presence, disability culture, and aesthetics. I do not have to create, in quotes, only about my disability. When I provide a proposal to the institution, I can work together with them regardless of my disability. People listen to my expertise and knowledge about my craft without the regard of my disability. I do not have to educate visitors or employees about structural ableism. I can avoid spending time with people I've learned to mistrust or who were learned to mistrust me. I can be sure my environment will react neutral and pleasant to me. If I raise my voice in a group of which I am the only member with a disability, I will be listened to. I do not have to speak on behalf of my group. And I do not go home feeling isolated, out of place, outnumbered, unheard, or held at a distance. That's the complete list. Does somebody want to react? <laughs> yes. um, I've been thinking more broadly about art education and the representation of art and around what we considered as being good art, good enough art and whatever, and a lot of ableism around there. And I think what this presentation captured was everything that I have concerns around the arts. The first thing you had on there was, I can participate with limited 
with a need for limited uh, assistance. Well, some people need 24 seven support and you know support. So where does that fit in? They might need assistance in terms of full-time support with their cognition, not only just psychological. So I ask the question, it's our education. It's not gonna include people with profound learning difficulties because they don't go into art education. So I just wonder to what extent you've captured what ableism means for a subsection of disabled people, as opposed to a whole, as opposed to everybody, who people, lots of people that don't even get into art college, and therefore they would ask, they would be additional things, additional things in there. And the reason I'm saying that is because I I've been involved in various sort of campaigns. Oh, um, and there have been some interesting big arguments about about, yeah, I, don't, I want people with profound learning difficulties, art outside a courtroom where it needs to be, you know, when we were campaigning on sort of disabled people's right to life. Um, I didn't want it on some website where nobody could see it. It was, you know, that's where it, that's where it needs to be with, with, you know, where it matters with all the other placards, right? So I had some real big issues around around sort of what we consider as art and ableism in the art, what's considered as acceptable, not acceptable. And I look at that, that the, the questions there, the, and I'm sitting there thinking, how many people with profound learning difficulties be welcome in that, in that space of, of not being ableist because they, they might well need 24 seven support and they might need support with cognition. And the other big issue around ableism and art is what is, isn't about the process of assessing art, but what is what is normal? What is considered good art? What you know? What is considered? Who defines that? You know? Who defines that? Because that's also innately ableism as well. Thank you. Um, I will be switching to this mic now. So we have one close to Ingrid and one for the running mic. Thank you so much for. Um, adding to this. Um, I think that's very valuable. I just have a comment, very short one. Um, as a person who is autistic and also might have learning difficulties and not been diagnosed, I just am very curious, how do you guys see like the barriers to even get like in high school before you can get into further art education. I think it's important to note that this from Josephine was an example of a work that is done to highlight some of the ableism that you can meet, but of course, for a lot of people, it's not really realistic in today's climate to be able to go to art school, but that's not really the point. The point was just to highlight some of the voices, but when it comes to the ableism uh, in schools, I think this is what we need to discuss. Like, how can we have the opportunities to go to art school and then also have to work in within the Maybe we don't want to do art. Maybe we want to be a fisher or a biologist and everything should be okay and be accessible for us so that we could choose what we want to. Uh, but this is just like a good example of all the ableism that, that is there. But I'm quite sure that you could go to any other school, high school, biology field, physics field, anywhere, and you would find the same ableism, but it would be about something else. It would be, no, we don't have any microscopes you can use. Uh, uh, why are you trying to to be a mathematician if you have this and this issue? So I think that the art education is not the important thing here. I think the important thing here is to take away the example of ableism that we could see. And then we still have to work in every field, unfortunately. Uh, as other pointed out, we are so far behind when it comes to the human rights. 
And that's a problem because people think that it's okay to discriminate us because of our bodies or our minds. They are like, no, but you are your diagnosis. So then it's not the same as sexism and racism. So we just have to keep on fighting and tell them until they, they understand and we are equal. Thank you. Um, maybe I can start to ask uh, Ingrid some questions. And then we have a more uh, interactive part uh, next to it. Um, so Ingrid, you already mentioned what um, ableism is for you. Um, could you tell us more about your personal journey understanding ableism? And if you could also define uh, internalized ableism and how did you experience it? And maybe what you managed to get rid of in terms of. So just some simple questions, yeah? Now, uh... I already gave a little bit of a teaser that for me, ableism wasn't something I understood that I was experiencing right away because I was brought up in a world that viewed disability as an illness, view my body as a medical problem. So what I was told was that you are the problem. You need to be fixed. You need to be repaired. And then I started to believe that and it's sort of internalized. So when I met discrimination, I did think that it was discrimination I just think that oh but that's yeah that's okay because people like me just have to accept this or people like me should be uh comfortable with being in the back of the concert not seeing or hearing anything uh, because that's safer for people like me but then I started to realize that that's not true my body it's nothing wrong with my body yeah it, it functions a little bit different I need some of you might hear a little bit of a buzzing sound, that's from my vent, uh, and I need some assistance. But when I'm able to have the accessibility that I need, I can participate, as you all know, when we are met as human beings, we can participate and be part of it. And that's when I started to understand that what I was experiencing was not okay. If I, I started to do an exercise in my head when I met something that I was like, ah, this doesn't feel good. And then I said to myself, okay, what if I put all the women at the concert at a special area and said, that, but it's safer for women to be at this special area that doesn't really have a good view of the, the, the artist and you can't really hear anything, but it's safer for women. Who would accept that? Like who, everyone would protest. Or if I said all the gays has to have a special toilet and that toilet has to have a key, no one else can access it. And you have to like locate five staff members to be able to go to that toilet, but it's because you're gay and it's going to be safer for you. No one would accept that. So and this you can do on and on uh, in every dis different scenario you meet. And then you will be like, oh, but if it's not okay for a woman, or okay for a gay man to be treated that way because of their minority identity, then it's not okay for me as a disabled person. And that's a task that's so easy to do. Like if you're you're experiencing something and you do that test in your mind, you can be like, ah, oh, but this is actually ableism and it's not okay and we have to stop it so that I can be equal. And that that's, sounds very simple. It's of course not as simple as it sounds, but, but it's an ongoing, journey that I do also with my own mind when I put my own like because you can also put your internalized ableism uh, and put it on yourself and be like oh but I should be able to do this why am I so lazy and it's like you're actually not that lazy you're just putting the society's pressure on yourself and that's also hard so it's like a two two-edged sword but I think the first step is to accept and be like this is actually ableism and it's not okay that it's happening to any of us Yes, please, uh, someone from the audience. Hi, my name is Thorpera from Iceland. It almost breaks my heart to listen to you. You're so much younger than me, but you've experienced the, experienced the same. Uh, things are just beginning to change. We are, we have, <laughs> we have not come so far. Uh, yeah, the, the society I grew up in was not for disabled uh, people. Uh, I was a, 
uh, it, it, the, the, mat the medical model was, uh, yeah. Uh, and I was told, or uh, if I couldn't do something the same way as a dis non-disabled person would do it, forget about it. I wanted to be a nurse, and the message was forget about it because I couldn't, <laughs> yeah, work as much uh, or do this and that like uh, a non-disabled nurse would do. So, yeah, I, I hope. I hope we are, yeah, we are on the right way, but it, it, it breaks my heart to, to hear that uh, people so much younger than me are ex experiencing the, the same things that I did. But yeah, we are moving in the right direction. There's some questions in the back. I hope this makes sense. Um, there's a loads and loads of talk um, from very strong black people advocates um, in England about the trauma that they experience because of the discrimination they, they, that they have in their life. Um, and ableism has that same effect. And you, you speak about the, um, for years, this is who I thought I was, and then I, I had a chance, and there's lots of people here probably who've had a similar chance to realize that that's not okay anymore. I work a lot of, um, alongside a lot of people in institutions, disabled people in long-term institutions, where you see the impact of that trauma because that's they believe it. You know, it's, it, it's at that. And I wonder whether, I'm not sure what the question is really, but it's that acknowledgement of the impact of ableism it's not just makes you angry and want to change it, and this is what we do. It's actually, there's a long-term impact on people. Um, and the only way I've got of thinking about that is really thinking about people I know, but also thinking about what I'm hearing and listening to and learning about from black people and Asian people, certainly in England, about the, the intergenerational impact on, of trauma on their lives and, and what it means to them in their community. So it's not much of a question. It's kind of coming back and echoing back what you're saying, I think. Um, thank you so much for your remark. It's also something I very much agree with. Um, and I mean, what I'm going to say now is a personal opinion, but sometimes I feel that the disability rights movement is not so much concerned as it should be about the impact, the emotional impact, the trauma, that we experience also as a disabled people. I am so here for fighting for rights because um, they should be common sense. But I think that position comes from also creating space for ourselves where we can also really let that impact and that trauma really land with us. And it's something that I, within my own artistic practice, focus on a lot. Like how can we, within what they didn't call a safer space or whatever, how, how do we build stuff, grassroots, bottom up, where we first of all support each other and then only then point outwards and try for change. Because I think that's really the most sustainable. Um, and sometimes I have the feeling that we, we, we're so high on our fight or really having our rights because it's also so important and they're also so difficult to maintain. Um, that sometimes I do also have the feeling of like, okay, but maybe we should turn inwards again and really focus on like, okay, but what's happening here with us? So thank you so much for this. Yes, I absolutely agree. I would like to say that uh, <clears throat> all the discussion, discussion that we already have <clears throat> in this panel, um, Remind me that how important uh, the peer counseling is because if we are growing up in the ableistic world, we are <coughs> living day by day in the ableistic world. That's no, this is no surprise that we internal internalize those ableism and <coughs> what is more, we 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 very uh, often um, tweet people with other impairments in a ableistic way. That's the other problem. Thank you.
Thank you. And I think we saw today just a good example that it's so easy to be ableistic because we're always navigating in an ableist world. So we're sort of like going to the same standards as the society instead of like being more radical. And in, uh, one of the organizations I work in back home uh, that's called Queer Disabled Norway, we use something that we call radical uh, accessibility. So it's uh, we use radical accessibility because every time we meet, accessibility has to be made in that space. We go around and in different ways we communicate what we need to be able to participate. Someone may, might need strong lighting, others need smaller lighting, and then we find out how can we exist together. And I think that radicalism is what we need more of, like also going out and, and claiming that space in the, when we're in mainstream society as well, telling people what we need uh, to be able to access. And it's true communication like we had today that we're able to, to actually make true accessibility spaces for all of us. Hi, sorry, it's me again. Sorry for taking up space, even though I shouldn't apologize. Internalized ableism, I guess. Um, I would like to point out that in the disabled community, at least from my experience, it is like, I cannot, I cannot say it's for everyone, but it's for me at least. I've experienced a lot of ableism from disabled people themselves. And usually I, it's from people who are not autistic or like, or specifically people who are physically disabled and not autistic. Because it's like, I'm not saying it goes for everyone. I'm saying it's actually a minority. I'm just saying that it's like the ableism makes people not be able to understand that we are all disabled, even though, and there's no like fighting over who is more disabled because we should just be standing together. Um. Thank you. Um. I am very aware of the person that I am, which is a person with an invisible, very passable physical disability and who only got their diagnosis of autism maybe three weeks ago, um, that I also have a set of characteristics and also a set of privilege that also makes me very, very inherently prone to making a lot of mistakes. The thing that you point out, and in, uh, as in, in disabled spaces and communities also experiencing ableism, is also something that happened to me. Um, but there's one thing that I would like to point out that I basically also keep as a mantra for myself, um, the two things, um, is that within disabled spaces, we should believe in good intentions. Outside of them, no fucking way. We don't have to. We don't have to. But within spaces of disabled people where we are talking to our peers within a gesture of care, of kinship, we can believe, I think, in good intentions. Um, and that's not ga gaslighting ourselves, I think. Um, secondarily, and that's the mantra I always keep in my head, because um, we know hurt people hurt people. Internalized ableism is a thing and whatever. Is that hate the system, not the people. And to always make that distinction. Um, and that is often as painful as it is because it takes labor, um, it takes grief, um, but that is something that personally for me, I try to keep in the front of my mind, in front of my mind when I experience something like this. Yeah. But I think it's better to use the microphone so, so we all hear. Uh, I would just like to say also it's it's very hard for me to think like some people I know it's just ignorance sometimes but I cannot excuse ignorance when it comes with hatred because these people actually called me like slurs and I think that's very different than being ignorant or like it's not the same thing as being hateful. Of course. Um... What I mean with we should think of people having good intentions, it doesn't mean that we have to gaslight ourselves into thinking nothing is happening. Um, but there, I think there is a position you can take to come to the table with peers who are also disabled to have a conversation with them. Um, you know, like, I'm not trying. This is not me telling you you should um, 
think have a, a a good reputation of people when they call you slurs. That's not what I was trying to say. I speak to somebody who is disabled, neurodivergent, and with visual impairment, and how much I've heard that in the past in the context of then finding people are just, I'm not saying you personally, but I, that, that rings alarm bells to me because that's what people say when you feel your access needs are not being met by disabled people. And whilst there are some good intentions, but sometimes in spaces that's used but before that's used, you get the sense somebody's being not ignorant, but just dismissive. I'm not, and I think it's really, we, I think we just need to just say that we're going to do the best we can. Um, but I'm, and it's interesting because I think the whole thing around ableism makes us focus possibly more on around the barriers that we face in accessing what is seen to be the norm, how we behave, things are norm. What ableism doesn't seem to do is acknowledge that actually we might need to change the whole system. And for me, I think what is coming over very clear for me today, because actually my boss, Tracy, did say, you know, she deliberately, I mean, I, I, I believe in disabledism, which she said to me, oh yeah, you better go and talk about disabledism. And now I can see why in terms of, in terms of what disabledism does, it makes you really understand what the barriers are and the oppression and, and the experiences that disabled people have feeling excluded by the barriers. And I think without really understanding disabledism, I feel like I think I feel today, and I don't mean it, it, I think it's brought home why actually I've got to go home and make sure that we never talk about ableism without disabledism. Because what disabledism does is actually, it really brings us home things. And I think if we understood what disabledism was, maybe some of the responses I got today might have been less likely to have happened because people would have been, yeah, that's a barrier, that's discrimination, that is it. I just read them. I, I just do what's required of me in that space. And there would be no, 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 whatever, because that would be rooted. I've been in situations where I've run networks and already I'm being told, oh, we need caption, da, da, da. Right, zip it, you just do it. Put the caption on. I do, my best intention, I try to make it accessible. I knew... Um, guy came along he said he was blind he wasn't able to access our network i just zipped it and i did it because i understood because disabledism was so profound in my life but oh my god i am actually being disabled right now and i've got to stop this meeting get this sorted and then restart again and i think that's probably where the difference is when you really understand what disabledism is you really do get that kind of sense of urgency to try and make you know and really understand what what we need to do quite quickly. Not not so not quickly, but you know, um, really understand the fundamentals. Yeah, maybe two other questions for you, and then we can uh, go to the interactive part. Um. um you're doing your PhD on uh, sexuality and disability, which is still uh, sometimes a taboo topic. Um, so could you tell us more about your work and also tell us about some common stereotypes and stigmas or barriers that disabled people face in when it comes to sexuality or dating, um, especially when it comes to disabled people with other intersecting identities? So I will try to keep it quick. I think I could talk about my PhD for days, but I'm not going to make you suffer so much about that. But my 
to make it simple, my PhD is about uh, independent living and how people that are dependent on personal assistance are able to live out our sexu sexuality and access our sexual citizenship. So, so it's easy. It's about asking first. I had uh, one hundred personal assistants and answer a survey to see what do personal assistants and people that work as personal assistants think about sexual citizenship and, and maybe assisting someone with exercising their sexual citizenship, for example, masturbation, going on a date, uh, using Tinder and stuff like that. And then I had almost the same survey go to disabled people living with personal assistants in Norway and around 70 people answered. Uh, and the interesting thing was that the personal assistants, they were kind of very positive. They were like, yeah, I don't mind uh, assisting anyone with sexual stuff if they need to, as long as it's very uh, good uh, routines around it and good communication. And the disabled people, what did we say? No, we said, absolutely not. I would never subject my personal assistant to that. They would probably quit. And it's so hard for me. And I don't think I could do it. And and it sixty seven percent of the respondents said, I would rather erase my sexuality than use assistance to live it out. That's sixty seven percent. That's a very high number, especially when we know that sexuality it's not only about having sex. It's about everything that makes us feel good, about falling in love, about feeling intimate with someone. It's it gives us. The warm feeling in the heart, it's about falling in love, but it can also be completely without love. It can be about only sex, or it can be about closeness, about who you think is hot, or who you want to talk to. So sexuality is very broad, uh, and it's very good for our mental health and our quality of life, if we have a possibility to live out our sexuality. So that 67% say, no, I don't have a sexuality. I just erase it because I don't want to subject my personal assistance to that. That's a problem. Yeah, that's a, a issue. And that is also the, the assistants seem to be more positive as long as they have a, a clear guideline and policy from their uh, service provider. And then right now I'm analyzing 10 qualitative interviews I did uh, with, no, I mean nine qualitative interviews I did with queer disabled people that has personal assistance services, just to see that will queer people have the same answers that the non-queer people that took the survey? Uh, unfortunately, a lot it's the same, but it also seemed that there are some possibilities in being queer. I talked about intersectionality earlier and that sometimes it can be uh, making double barriers, but it can also sometimes uh, be intersectional growth. Right? That it's a growth because you have two identities. So it seems like these people that are queer and disabled like myself and have personal assistance, they are more relaxed on their sexuality and often they, they hire queer personal assistants and then they find it li a little bit easier to talk to other queer people about sexuality. So so it's some interesting findings that I'm uh, looking into, but maybe the my main finding is that we don't talk enough about it. It's something we, we never talk about. It's often the focus is like, making sure that no one gets pregnant and no one gets ill. And other than that, we don't talk about sexual pleasure. We don't talk about how we might need to creep our sexual practices. Maybe what we see in the porn movies or in movies are not how we're supposed to have sex. Maybe we need to adapt our sexual uh, activities to how our bodies work. Maybe pleasure for us is something different. Maybe what we like and what we want to do it's not like the mainstream society, and that's also okay. So we have to like reclaim our sexualities and, and make it crip. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if someone wants to comment on this. Yes. Um, this is super interesting. It's one of my research areas. Um, I was quite surprised to learn about your findings in the survey you conducted. And you said that PAs were in general quite happy to assist in kind of in facilitate in the in the facilitation of sexual citizenship, but obviously for disabled people they weren't as keen on the idea. And then obviously you read out some quite I found quite surprising statistics. 
Um, I just have, how would you, uh, you, using your research, how would you kind of promote the kind of, the, how would you promote sexual citizenship amongst disabled people? If you could wave your magic wand to be as idealistic as possible um, with kind of, how would you encourage this with those who do use personal assistance on a day-to-day -day basis? Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, the magic wand. Well, that would be really nice. I think I would start it in the schools because I think a lot of the issue is that disabled people uh, like myself doesn't have proper sexual education. So you don't know exactly what. Uh, and then when it comes to personal assistance specific, I think that the municipalities in Norway, because my research is done in Norway, that are the ones that uh, goes with service provider and have contracts for personal assistance, they need to put sexual citizenship and how to talk about sexuality in their contracts so that the service provider has to do, do it. And this is also what both the surveys, both the personal assistance, the survey uh, of the disabled people and the queer disabled people I talked to all said, I wish my provider had some special class, a way to that we could communicate, someone I could call to ask, how can I ask my assistant? How can I make this this safe uh, and how can I make it safe for me and for my assistant because at least in Norway we've had legal cases in both ways both personal assistants abusing the, the disabled person as well as disabled persons uh, abusing their assistants and I mean if you don't have policy no one talks about sex uh, and no one talks about how sexuality and personal assistance is going to be that it's not weird that some people are are mixing stuff up because we don't talk about sexual disability and make us aware of what are the boundaries how can you have assistance with what is the difference between having sex uh, and having facilitation for masturbation because that's two completely different things and a personal assistant should never have sex with their disabled person of course but facilitating for masturbation is something completely different but it has to be different both for the disabled person and for the personal assistants and it's of course something should that should always be voluntarily maybe not all personal assistants want to facilitate and maybe not all disabled people would like their assistant to facilitate. And that's also okay. There are a lot of ways to find access to your sexual citizenship, but if we don't talk about it, people might not know how they can deal with it and then it gets um, mental health issues or other issues instead of actually being quite simple solutions for it. Okay, maybe one last question, and then we can hear maybe the same answer from you, Josephine, and from the audience. Um, disabled people are often asked to accept themselves, accept their bodies, um, and we all make great efforts in uh, accepting ourselves or be proud of our disability, um, stop apologizing for our accessibility needs. Uh, but then when we go out in society, um, we can't access the cinema, we can't access the same information during a conference. Uh, there are many issues. Um, so how do you deal with uh, this and what can we do um, to make a more collective effort instead of promoting a kind of individual acceptance? Yeah, I think like acceptance is nice when it comes to like accepting who you are, working on who, like that you're beautiful and stuff like that, but you should never accept uh, ableism and you should never accept discrimination uh, and people that tie right to be like, oh, you should just accept who you are and who you are cannot go to the cinema, that, that they are the problem and we need to start uh, asking the questions back, the hard questions, and we shouldn't be alone. Like all of us are here because we are related to some kind of disability organization back home. So we are many people that can stand together and it can be local issues, but it can also be more national issues. And I think like stopping accepting the ableism and being like, no, I'm actually allowed. And a simple thing you can do based on the legislation where you're living is to uh, report it. A lot of places actually do have kind of good systems for reporting, but disabled people, we don't report. 
because a lot of times I think, oh no, I'm just gonna lose anyway, or I don't have time, or maybe I maybe I was wrong, maybe this is a discrimination, maybe I was just very unpractical today. Uh, starting report. Be be someone's friend. Like maybe if you have a friend, you can be like, okay, but we can report together. Like if you you are facing discrimination, until then, next time you call me and we write the report together. So starting to do do that, it's the small things. Uh, and then we also have to do the big things. But I think the small things uh, are are a start, and that's something everyone can do or try to do. And and now my opinion. <laughs> um, a thing I wanted to point out with the answer that you gave is the needs um, is complaining. Um, I think we don't talk enough about how important it is to complain. Um, and here I'm thinking of um, what uh, writer Sada Ahmed has done in her um, one of her books uh, called Complaints, so like how we can use complaints as diversity work. Um, so whenever I have to talk with cultural instances and cultural houses and theaters and whatever, one of the things I always tell them to do is that there needs to be a point where people can complain. The more we complain, the more visible we become. And um, the structure of complaints or like when, for example, you have 20 complaints, you will see in your institution where something is going wrong. They are basically a map of where um, your institution is malfunctioning. So it points out very beautifully which sometimes very particular and very concrete things can be solved by a matter of complaining. Um, it makes me think of uh, Mira, the other person who helped me with the interviews um, in one of the cultural houses got stuck in an elevator and then we uh, complained and kept complaining and complaining and today they are renovating the elevator. We're getting a new elevator and that's because of the reason why we were sitting there on their desk saying this was something we can't do, etc, etc, etc. So first of all, complaining. Secondarily, we need our allies. And then I don't mean specifically non-disabled people, but then I'm also very specifically looking to the queer communities and also to people of color. Because I think I radically, radically stand for the idea that every step towards accessibility is a step towards decolonization and vice versa. We need each other. Um, like I said at the beginning, it's the same wallet, but different money. Um, and I think that that is also something that other communities have to understand that in fighting for our rights, they will inherently also win more rights for themselves. That, um, and then the third thing that always needs to happen is that we need in every institution, in every house we enter, people with disabilities need to be in positions of decision-making um, where decisions are made and we need our people there. Um, we need to see people with disabilities represented throughout every layer of an organization, through every aspect, through every house, every culture, every cinema, et cetera, et cetera. We need to be there. Um, and as a, it's not that we have to force ourselves, but it's the other way around. They should be given to us. Because um, what we can offer in the knowledge that we have, which is also something very specific, is an advantage to these institutions and that's still something they don't see. Yes, thank you. I absolutely agree. And also, I think in Flanders, in Belgium, we still sometimes live in the 80s. We are not the UK. 
we still oh, no I, I mean <laughs> No, but that is the thing. In Belgium, when we have a conversation on disability, everybody looks to the UK. Because um, we we are absolutely not yet to that point where um, certain rights or, or certain certain awareness is already created, like we see it in the UK. Like we are a group of people living in a geographical location that look up to the UK um, and very much look up to them as an example. Yes. <laughs> I I thought so already. Given the given the UK are the only country that's been found um has been taken as uh, been taken on the protocol. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the 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 I am going to be the last person that is going to tell you guys that the situation of ableism has been solved in the UK. Um but uh, a lot of things that are already happening there aren't even isn't isn't even a conversation here like for example one of the biggest one is like for example public transport like the, the example that you gave um is still something that is highly 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 problematic the way that for example if you're a wheelchair user if you need to take the train it's a mess um and what i wanted to say with this yeah but there's a conversation about it in belgium there's not even a conversation this, this, we don't even talk about it yet. It's not even, it hasn't even rise to the surface. It hasn't even rise to the point of policymakers wanting to actually talk and maybe order different trains or change the, 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 the... yeah. Come again. What's the question? I'm following the European directive that made it that absolutely clear that you can't have this discrimination legislation. Well, if they have one, Belgium is definitely not listening to it. Question. On the top of my head, I think we signed it, but it is not something we are concerned with. Signed what? I, is it a UN declaration? I have to think. My, yeah, I, I, do you have, yes. Well, do you have Belgium legislation? I'm asking does Belgium have so in UK we have what's called the equality. Yeah. We don't. Yeah. We don't. Also nothing considering, for example, the American, what is it, Article 504? Yeah. The, no, nothing. Yeah. Yes. That's how bad it is here. <laughs> you have a, a question. But it's also about visibility. I shout to her and say you need to give.
So I, I would prefer to for example, to someone not covered them to be travel and I have colleagues who actually pay out of their own pocket for their teeth, for their their children's assistance, for their disabled child assistance at school so they can be educated in the mainstream setting. So they actually they spend them um, because they're like I said, it's segregated and as a result, I think the reason why people don't care about them is that Absolutely. And I think Belgium definitely has a conversation to be had on special education, but I also want to nuance this because there are a lot of people with disabilities that do have mainstream education, as in, for example, I did. Um, I think Ingrid is going to react and then we have time for one more question, right? Um, yes. I think you're you're absolutely right. I'm looking forward to leading that workshop with you in two years time. <laughs> I will be, be a blast. No, but I think independent living is uh, the core because a lot of us, if before we got personal assistance for those who are lucky as we have it, then you meet ableism every day, like home health nursing. I don't know anyone who is more ableist than the home health nursing system. So like being able to choose your own assistance and deciding who are you letting into your life? Who do you want to have assist you? And then maybe some of us, depending on what we need, will educate them. You can't say that to me because it's ableist or just educate through learning. And that's why independent living in many ways is the key, but not only for us. But I think when we hire people and they are used to working in home health or in institutions and then they start working as personal assistants and then, then they see what we are able to do, that we are actually human beings like everyone else with human rights, they start to advocate. I have a lot of personal assistants that have gone uh, after their studies with 
they stopped working with me, they've started working for our rights because they understand that they are true allies because they've seen how important it is for us to be able to participate. So I think independent living is the solution in many ways, not only for us, but also for reaching out to the able-bodied or non-disabled uh, population. Okay, there was one more question. Um, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for this remark, because this is also my experience as somebody who is invisibly very passable, disabled. This has also very much been my journey of daring to use the word um, disabled. And I think also uh, your words on being kind to another is also what I meant earlier with we need to think of good intentions. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you uh, for sharing that experience. And I think a lot of us can uh, can relate. Uh, my disability is very visible now, but when I was growing up, it was invisible. So I understand uh, the struggle of being disabled enough. And that's also why one of my organizations in the slogan of that, and I wanted to, to end with that today, is that... Uh, you are disabled enough, you are queer enough, and you are good enough. And that's because all of us needs to hear that. And that applies to all of you. Maybe not the queer part, but you are disabled enough and you are good enough. And if you want to, you are queer enough too. <laughs> okay, we only have a few minutes left. So um, one last question. Uh, for Ingrid yep. and Josephine and for all of you. But also, who wants to top that statement? Okay, thank you everyone uh, for attending the workshop. No. Um, thanks. <laughs>